Yeah. Um, all right, so that's, we won't do that one. Uh, cool. Uh, all right, well, I guess we will, we will start where we usually start. Mm-hmm. The superhero origin story. Pete <laughs> or Alkistus, who would like to go first? Well, Alkistus will go first. No. Uh, let's do that. No. Yeah. Are you, is it already going to call Yeah, it is. Oh, <laughs> here we go. Here's the laugh, and we're on. <laughs> Can we start again? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> we'll probably get through that one yeah. first. Okay. Now, kiss this origin story. Take two. <sighs> Do you mean origins in magic? Yes. What was it? Were there um, incidents in your childhood? Okay. That this goes. This is confu- confusing because. Always my childhood was very strange from very, very beginning. But in magic is very late in the Western tradition because it didn't really happen properly until I met Peter, which was not that long ago. Just a bit before we started Scarlet. Yeah, so probably about eight years ago. Yeah, so that was my introduction to the Western esoteric tradition specifically. Um, childhood, just very weird, you know. Everything except the alien abduction. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've listened to all the other interviews. Yeah, no, I will, I will find someone who's been abducted mm. by aliens. Yeah, yeah I know you're find looking. One person. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, mm. sort of, do you have that kind of high strangeness incident in yes, your childhood? Yes. Uh, well, I was brought up in Portugal and that was already kind of dislocated. And then I came to England and we lived in an old, old house and there were lots of spirits in the house. And they weren't all ghosts, there were sort of other things there too. And the family's very old and there's a lot of background and karma going on with my family. Which you can probably explain a little bit. I can explain that. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to explain? Please. (laughs) I want to be mysterious. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you're succeeding. (laughs) Um, (laughs) What can I say about it? Well, mm, very, very mixed blood. There were people that came from a lot of different places. And they were very sort of much colonial people. So, like, I guess the immediate background is uh, on my father's side, Maltese via Africa, or Africa from Malta originally, and you know, other stuff, some Scottish and German and Spanish. And on my mother's side, mainly Naples, Italy. And uh, so, we lived in this old house which was. Mm, my great aunt's house and lots and lots of old people living in there and things and stuff they'd collected from the, the history of the family and I used to talk to things and I think I might have been the only one that was really talking to things <laughs> there and I realised that maybe this is not what adults or other children did but you know and yeah so I kind of, I had that for a long time probably more lo- longer than most people have their imaginary friends for And and then it all kind of went super weird when I got into teenager time, like 14, 15, I got uh, sort of out of control depression and with a lot of psychic stuff happening and um, intrusions, kind of attacks and stuff that I had for about 10 years without being able to cope or do anything about until uh, a friend at the time introduced me to the books of someone called Glenn Morris who's an American ninja (laughs) who had done a lot of strange stuff and I got in touch with him and started a friendship with him and he helped dealing with these kind of incursions and then I got mixed up in a lot of other things too (laughs) and then I met Peter yeah Right. Um, so it was kind of full on, it's been full on all my life I've just been like mainly mainly flailing and dealing with stuff and gradually uh, so going from a position of what is all this stuff? It's definitely something's happening to me to being conversant with spirits, being able to talk to them and interact. That's my interest. I like spirits. That's the kind of thing I like doing. Well, if you were talking to them as a child, these uh, are yeah. in the house. I mean, the objects yeah. that you would talk to, are we sort of talking post imperial antiques, that kind of thing? Yeah. Oh, they weren't objects, but in retrospect, looking back and thinking about it, I think a lot of them were spirits attached to the old objects from different parts of the world. They were sort of... It's really hard to describe what they were, because even at the time I didn't know. They were sort of animal forms and other things, and... Sigh. <laughs> <laughs> 
I remember talking to things that I thought were fairies of some kind. They had that sort of quality about them. And in my childhood, I just assumed they were fairies. And at some point, I remember panicking and thinking, fairies are really dangerous. I need to talk to witches to learn how to deal with fairies. And I don't know where this idea came to me from because I didn't have any of that material to hand. It was just like living in Victorian world. It was a Victorian household and it was very much children are seen and not heard. And I mean, they were, it was like a time capsule, growing up in a time capsule. And yeah, I didn't realise how different it was to the rest of the world <laughs> because it was just this very weird insular universe. And uh, so I kind of realised at some point that I had to have more skills to be able to deal with these things because I realised they were quite ambivalent and so I thought witches might be the answer for some reason I thought witches had a had a techniques that would enable one to communicate more safely with the spirit world don't know where that came from though because it's not like I had that in my family just uh, when when you say that it wasn't in your family I mean yeah. there, there appears to be a lot of people living in the house yeah. I well, it's very funny. Did it come up in discussion? I mean, no, but they did joke that they were the three witches. There were my two. There was my grandmother, and um, her two sisters, and they were these sort of identical-looking, white-haired, strange, uh, colonial African ladies from another age. And they were lovely and different and strange and eccentric. Um, I guess there was there was talk of. Africa and what happened there, but it was never really feeling, I never felt Africa that I came from there because it was my father's generation. He left when he was 16, so he still considers himself African very much. It's, um, yeah, it's not me. I always felt a stronger connection with the Italian side. Mm -hmm. Although on my father's side was, I found out the, um, Teresa of Avila was one of the ancestors, so then that kind of... But I found that out many, many years later, many years later, after after some other strange experiences in which she came up when I was taking ayahuasca, quite um, quite an intense series of, of workings with ayahuasca, and people were saying, I'm sensing a lot of Teresa around you, this kind of, you know, new age, like, wacky people, and I'm like, that's strange. That's interesting, but I didn't know about it then. And then I heard afterwards, I found some old manuscripts from the family. And then things started to make a little bit more sense. <laughs> there is a definite current of madness in my family. A lot of the people in my family are like crazy. Or depressive, let's say, melancholics. They have the strong Saturnine influence. They're yeah. artists and <sighs> eccentrics. There's my origins. <laughs> 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 Uh, so yeah. everything but aliens. <laughs> yeah, I mean, mm. definitely, it's it's interesting. Uh, the 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 attacks that you referred to, mm. um, which you, I mean, there's fairly common ones. I've mm. had some of the things mm. with that um, sleep paralysis yeah. hag attack thing. Is, is it? Yeah. yeah, some of them were like that. Some of them were waking. Some of them were uh, almost close to poltergeist activity with the bed and things shaking, with nothing else moving in the room. Um, I mean, afterwards I realized that it was probably related. I had some weird Kundalini, in, uh, like a, what is it, spontaneous Kundalini mm -hmm. activities around the same time. There was a great deal of stress in my life and um, the hormone explosion relating. And I think they were just like, this is food. I was food. So I spent 10 years being preyed upon by this kind of uh, activity. I don't know how to describe it. It's, weird but it was really the more fear they can get out of you and the more energy they can sort of get out of you when you're relating to them they, they, they just keep coming but it pretty much ended after I learned some techniques from Glenn and then it was only a few times after that that it happened very much out of the blue on particular you know occasions when I was taken unaware not most of the time I could control it after that so, do you have any tips for how you fight poltergeists with ninjutsu? <laughs> with ninjutsu? <laughs> well, <laughs> this is where I lose all credibility. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, <it's> awesome. <laughs> I have to say, Glenn was amazing. He really, he just said things like they were, and he was very down to earth. And, uh, how do you mastery of your emotions, being able to 
essentially he just got me working with the orbits and doing things very much like the Mantak Chia book say so you start to I had all this energy I had too much energy it was just I was out of control with it it was sort of like coming off me and I think the problem was that was it I wasn't circling it it wasn't staying in the right place I was using it very eccentrically to cope with depression as well so I would um, ramp up the energy just to get myself out of you know suicidal slumps and things and that was it was like the only techniques I knew to like not kill myself for a long time and it wasn't really a long-term strategy because it was just depleting me and other things were kind of like hanging around waiting for me to fall or whatever like vultures so it was just a internalizing things more being more in control of emotions knowing yourself I mean it just started when I started communicating with Glenn then it was a long long process beginning it was just taken <laughs> still in process of knowing who you are and how you work and that yeah the, the energy the energy the emotion the psychology everything is just on every level it's it's, it's a lot of work yeah, yeah. Um, I, I quite like that analogy or that interpretation of what uh, happened about ramping up the energy so it's almost like mm. um, overheating the house to, something to cook like something yeah, and yeah. so you're uh, overusing the energy because there's one part of it that's malfunctioning yeah. Yeah. Uh, I like that I'm going to think on that because mm. um, that, that would fit some things that yeah. I, well, I historically think, experienced I mean I'm kind of bipolar at the moment but more manageable because I make a lot of effort with diet and exercise and things but at the time the depression was so strong that unless I could fight back with something equally strong on the other side then it was really hard to to cope with things had to even get yourself out of that so it was sort of willed <laughs> willed Im unbalancing of the depressive state but not healthy long term <laughs> well no so I mean then the ninjutsu mm. tip if we could reduce yeah. that's a terrible word never mind um, <laughs> ninjutsu says <laughs> <laughs> uh, what you're saying about the orbits and, and, yeah. and Glenn recognising that the um, uh, the energy needed to be recircuited differently uh, yeah. and that was sort of yeah. how that's, it, that, that's cool yeah. I see what you, you mean about um, everything but the western esoteric tradition until it showed up yeah. because you've just yeah. covered the gamut of yeah. Kundalini yeah. experience poltergeists yeah. Um, yeah, I got very. Um, I did a lot of meditation and things once I had started talking to Glenn and got drawn towards more tantric methods and working with um, Kurukula. The, she's like a Dakini similar to Babylon in some ways. Uh, magic. <laughs> 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 I mean, it's always that. I mean, when Glenn met me, he was like. Are you a witch or a fairy? I mean, he saw the same things too, and it was just like, you've always got something, but you don't know what you're doing or what you are yet. <laughs> it's just, I thought, and he just laughed at me. He thought it was very amusing. <laughs> but, yeah. It's interesting it's like, that he used those choices of words. I know, yeah, he thought I was kind of an, an elf or a witch. One, well, both he described me as. Yeah. So, I don't know. <laughs> at the time, it was just like, that's cool, Glenn thinks I'm an elf. <laughs> <laughs> better get working <laughs> yeah mm. I had no idea I'd end up doing this or meet Peter but that's that's how it's happened and now I'm just I love the western tradition that's what I am I can kind of see that all the time I've been I was looking for other things and trying to work out what is it what is it it's here right here under our feet but it doesn't all come from here it's very confusing <laughs> <laughs> yeah so yeah well that was really good that's my story Peter let's do <laughs> Yeah, Mr. Gray, same question. Magical well, origin story, weird childhood. Well, mine's kind of coming from the opposite angle because um, Alcesty was really responding to need. So she was in a, she, I mean, you were in essentially a state of, of crisis as a result yeah. of the, the constant magical incursions and mm. and also the the physical changes that were that were going through you, mm. which, which which has left you in a position where you're particularly fitted for spirit work, um, rather than most people in the western tradition have no experience of spirits at all and most of their magic is is built around preventing them having direct spirit experience so when you come from a, a childhood background of going through 
these possession states mm. and going through these incursions, it makes you much more um, m- much more able to deal with the other side rather than rather than the Western approach, which for male magicians tends to be much more cerebral mm. and actually blocks um, blocks a lot of the emotional. Um, upheaval that's required for people to be successful spirit workers and I, and I think in the West there's been a, a confusion and there's an idea that, that the magician is this this towering um, you know indomitable will um, or that magic is some form of self-development that results in balanced people and that clearly isn't the case in traditional societies because um, the, the people who are magical practitioners are the people who are able to access these emotional states and are able to access spirits and are able to function with them. So Augusti came from the position which is quite 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 normal in the West, which is no spiritual background um, and a hell of a lot of phenomena. I did have a spiritual background. We had well, spiritual had background from Catholicism, which you rejected. Which I you think had is a quite important part yeah. of my background and should be. I don't know. It's important. It should be yeah. acknowledged in the Western tradition as a, not just something that's. <coughs> covered up and we, we don't uh, you know there is something very strong in the Catholic and in the Orthodox as well yeah yeah you know hence all the all the references to witchcraft it, you know when you see people talking about you know the old religion most of the time they're talking about Catholicism because mm. Catholicism has all the fake practices so but Peter I, what did you so think? I got all the fake practices from the Catholicism and I came from a, a different angle um, I grew up in a, a an atheist rationalist um, household um, and I went to uh, a church-based um, primary school, Church of England, and my, my immediate con- contact with Christianity, um, I, I saw it immediately as a, as a fraud. Um, I've never had, I've, I've never had a, a, a Christian um, conditioning set that I needed to break because my, my first contact with it is quite clearly that, that the Old Testament God is... is is, is a monster who you wouldn't wish to worship anyway and um, and the Jesus figure I think is a, is, a, is is a lie as well so growing up with a growing up with that in a small rural community I was um, I rejected I rejected religion um, entirely and my my reaction was to pursue um, existentialism and Marxism and um, self-development and throw pretty much everything spiritual um, out of the window but that concealed a a, a dichotomy that I had um, which was that um, I was strongly drawn to the pre-Christian religions um, and my reading of those was was very different to the experience I had when I encountered Christianity and I was also um, growing up in a very um, in a very harsh environment. I mean, Cornwall is um, Cornwall is a particularly unforgiving place, and I grew up in a yeah, I grew up in a pretty isolated spot. So I was raised largely by my socialisation with with the animal spirits. So so I was socialised by by crows, um, and I was socialised by my encounters with um, various other um, various other animals, which I which I won't name. Um, and I spent a lot of time, I spent a lot of time in, in raw nature. So when in The Red Goddess, one of, the, one of the critical points of that book is talking about the experience of letting go and the importance of letting go, which is something that men in particular find so, difficult, and especially, especially um, heterosexual men. Um, I grew up in an environment where I was, um, where I was surfing in the Atlantic in, in February, and I had, had a, few, um, a few near drowning experiences. Um, and since then, in my in my sort of early twenties, I mean, I I travelled and surfed most places in the world in, in in very big surf. And one of the things that you learn when you're in that kind of environment is that nature is a lot bigger than you, and that if you aren't able to enter into states of deep surrender when confronted by um, <laughs> threatening forty foot walls of uh, Walls of salt water, then you're you're not going to last very long. So I, I learned an awful lot from my exposure to 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 the elements. Um, but it was only when I really uh, hit my hit my twenties at university, and I was following my I was following my my quest for sort of uh, 
mind expansion by reading everything I could get my hands on. Inevitably, I ended up reading the material on the occult because it was forbidden and beginning to uh, beginning to perform, perform the rudimentary experiments. And the, the results that I got from my experiments um, proved to me what I was, you know, what I was not expecting is that there were intelligences out there which it was possible to communicate with. And so I continued to pursue those experiments and that led me through into the Western tradition. But from there it was really a fairly standard Western Western magical um, Western magical self-education. So I went through um, all of the Flemic material simply because Crowley appeared to be the smartest guy out there. Um, but but obviously the the whole religious aspect of it, which is which is tacked onto it, I found I found rather rather objectionable um, and unnecessary. But having met you know meeting Alcesti, um we we both done we both done quite similar things. We both had a very a very physical approach to magic. So when we talk about magic and we talk about possession and we talk about the wilderness that's because these are things which are grounded in our bodies and grounded in our experience and when we talk about sex magic we talk about sex magic because we are grounded in our bodies and our practice is based on diet exercise you know visualization spirit contact a whole whole it's raft very, of things very basic foundation it's not glamorous yeah <laughs> yeah yeah it's a lot of a lot of, a lot of hard work yeah yeah, that's that's where it is. Interesting. So, um, can you recall when you were at university the first few occult books? I ask everyone this because it always ends up being mastering witchcraft. Um, magic and theory and practice. Yeah. Okay. Magic and theory and practice made sense. I mean, I you know obviously. Are you sure it wasn't mastering witchcraft? I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean the 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 other thing is the the. Um, I mean, Gordon, you had the experience on the edge of empire with the kind mm. of books that you could get hold of. When I was, when I was studying magic, it was the case that the only place that you could get magic books was in second-hand bookshops, where the person behind the counter would give you a dirty book if you look if you asked for the the Crowley books. And um, it was wasn't that bad. <laughs> it was um, it was difficult to get hold of material, mm. and it was difficult to get hold of good material. And that's something that that is very difficult for people who've grown up with the internet to understand. Simply that. The limitations on what was available but the bonus of that was the fact that the material that you did get hold of you worked with yeah because you weren't in a constant pick and mix um, upgrade cycle where you'd just be looking for the next the next the next exciting book publishing superpower yeah yeah that's an interesting observation I've done so when I think of the early magical practices in Australia because and there was no such thing as bad books. If the book mm. was in my hand, it was a good book. You're, yeah, you're and you had to unlearn. Yeah. Like actually, these are terrible yeah. books. But when I think, <laughs> mm. of, you you did work with them. You even worked with terrible, terrible books. Yeah, uh, yeah. Which I'm probably not going to name, but you can guess. And um, mm. you end up doing stuff, and you have to unlearn things as you move uh, further through it. But it's yeah, yeah. You don't have that today, You're right? You can kind of optimize. Um, you're, you're a few clips away from um, a, a, a better or a, a more preferred invocation of the sylphs uh, yeah. on the internet and you can just kind of quickly scale up to the thing that matches you and maybe isn't the right thing for you to do because there should be challenge and push in it. Yeah, I think it's far easier for you to pursue magic as, as a lifestyle choice and end up creating something which is um, simply pandering to... Um, pandering to aspects of your ego or, or the developmental state which you're privileging rather than necessarily engaging in the work and, um, and undergoing self-change and gaining self-knowledge. Mm. Um, so I think, you know, contrary to, to our position of being a publisher, people very often need less rather than more books. Definitely. You know, a good example would be um, the progress that, that Jake um, made by simply having the single book yeah, yeah. that he's concentrated on which has enabled him to form a frame around that um, or the work that, that Michael Cecatelli was able to do by translating these books while in solitary confinement the fact that he was in these reduced and difficult circumstances meant that he was able to 
achieved more with his magical work in that than I'm sure he would have done if he was on the outside. Mm. That's I yeah. I, I'm recalling the the times where my own sort of experience jumped and it was restricted books and restricted circumstances. I, when I first moved to Sydney, I was in. Well, we're, by the way, we're in a really really awful awful office for this. Um, <laughs> It, it feels like we're in an airport prison, but it's that's also what my first apartment in Sydney was like. It's about this size, and I had one book, and it was Crowley's Big Blue Four. Yeah. So there was enough stuff in it, but it was one book, mm. some printouts of the Stella revealing <laughs> yep. blue tack to the wall, uh, and but there was there was significant daily practice. I had no money to do anything else anyway, yeah. but I had one book. Well, I think <laughs> this having less is often the best way to just yeah. get work done. Yeah. Yeah. And having that having the simplicity of that daily practice rather than moving on and finding like a million things that you might want to dally with for a while. Yeah. I mean, you see people who work people who work and commit to, to to a system, however poor a system is, get get far far better results and more progress than people who are continuing to continuing to pick and choose. So could we make the macro observation that say in the in the Renaissance mastery was achieved by um, obviously people were doing the work but were was achieved by reading all the things because knowledge was very difficult to get a hold of so Plato and, and the Hermeticism and if you look at it today it's almost the complete reverse sure. yeah. where um, mastery is achieved with removing uh, extra stuff once well, you've accumulated it. I think in the Renaissance you're in a position where you could actually read the entire corpus of human knowledge. I mean, it was still possible to be a generalist and have a That's have a clear thing. understanding across things, whereas now, now that becomes extremely difficult to do. But one thing... One thing that I think people people should be doing more of in the occult is reading widely and reading outside the subject. So, for example, um, we... We work a lot with green language, and in order to understand the green language and be conversant with it as the language which spirits spirits speak to you in, if you simply read a card books, you're not going to get anywhere. Whereas if you have a background in reading Jean Genet, then you're going to have an ability to understand Lovely. the levels of language <laughs> and the games of language that are occurring. So, I think a cult study has become too focused. On um, on these the, the supposed occult books, and to a degree, it's excluded other elements from the canon, which would create more rounded and more and, and, and better functional magical practitioners. Mm. Um, to I'm I'm trying to put the sequence of um, life uh, of respective lives in my head between. So we've got to sort of college in Pete's case, mm. sure. more or less. Where did I go? I don't yeah. know. <laughs> and, then, and, then we have, uh, and then we have the gap, and then we'll get onto the story yeah. of Scarlet and Bridget, yeah. because somewhere in there, you both lived in London. Um, I, thought you, I, thought you, oh. I was in London. Oh, yes. Yeah. You weren't. You no. were working here. Yeah, I was working here. So, um, so Arcus has kind of um, got entry into a variety of prestigious universities and anyway. dropped out of all of them. <laughs> um, because the last she's one I only dropped out at the very end. I did actually finish. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, but I didn't need the degree. Yeah, but as an anarchist, that was kind of your, your I'm reaction. I'm an artist. I don't want to be a teacher. <laughs> That's what I was thinking at the time while well, having a breakdown. <laughs> Another one. And then you pursued dance. Um, I started dancing when I was 28, which was about three years after I left university. I was at university quite late. Yeah, I started as a mature student and spent a long time there like, finding things. I was studying dance at university but more from a theoretical perspective because I thought I would be a director or I was interested in Asian theatre and drama and music and having been very influenced by Arto, which was probably my first magical book. Mm -hmm. Arto collected works. And out for Jerry has to go along there too because I discovered him immediately after Otto. <laughs> and they were my kind of guiding lights. And I just decided that it was in theatre, it was in theatre, it had to be somewhere there, this, this thing I was looking for. So I had, um, and I was very drawn to the, the East. So I went initially to study uh, Arabic and then I changed after a year and 
went into uh, music and history of art because I didn't want to just get tied into one culture. I wanted to spend a lot of time exploring everything. Yeah. Um, then I, I mean, I became a Buddha dancer three years after that. I just decided at 28, um, this is it. I've seen it. I know what I want to do. And stopped everything and decided to do that. Dropped out of civilian life. <laughs> Lost my foothold. And... Yeah, so kind of at the age that a lot of people are retiring from dance, yeah. I, just, I embarked on my training. <laughs> yeah. So in that gap, the, the yeah. three-year gap, you, you lived in London. I was living we, we, in London, yeah. mostly like rubbish job, just because I was being an artist and thinking I'll have a part-time job or a simple job with no responsibilities and spend my time. I was doing things like working on film scripts with a friend of mine and, you know, painting or drawing, writing, trying to do all sorts of things, because I, I was still not sure exactly what it was I was meant to do. I've, that, I was drawn to theatre and dance and these things for such a long time, from very young, but I never put myself in the position of being the one there, I'm too shy, I'm, so, <laughs> I'm not actually going to get on stage, I'm going to tell people what to do, <laughs> I'm going to have ideas. <laughs> this. Um, in the end, it, it came down to crisis again. Crisis teaches me everything, but it was really... I saw Bhutan, I saw a performance. Mm -hmm. And I had read before I saw the performance, I had been reading the writing of Hijikata Tatsumi, who is the founder of Bhutan. And it just struck me that here is an art form which needs nothing except your body. It's like the most pure form of witchcraft in a way, because everything is generated and revealed by the body, nothing else. No, it didn't need a props, it didn't need a stage, it could happen in any context, at any time. So I, when I stopped uh, working and started this, I, I went straight in and did my first performance two weeks later. And I figured that the only way to learn how to do this is to perform and to put yourself into that crucible. And that's how you really learn, because that's it's the audience and that relation, that space, being in that sort of that lens with the fire, <laughs> that really changes you and, and and makes you grow. So of course the things I did were terrible, <laughs> but and it also teaches you to drop all the personal stuff. You know, it didn't matter that I'm very shy in real life, because when you're there, you're not you, or you are you, but you're something beyond all your daily uh, what you carry with you, who you are when you're just walking down the street or something. Then, yeah, I've just been doing that since. And um, exploring other things, I was carrying on with my energy work, with some meditation, um, doing Qigong, some Tibetan things, all sorts of stuff, and just doing this at the same time as Bhutto. And they're kind of blending together. And, well, I found that the Bhutto was highly, highly <sighs> able to absorb these energy practices. It's like a very strong energy work. Um, probably something that would make Tai Chi practitioners shudder with horror because the, some of the some of the things you do to yourself with Buddha are very perverse and but it has an interior realm, an interior dynamic which is completely absent from any other art or dance form or, or even theatrical thing it's, it's so much deeper than any other acting or anything I've experienced that really resonates when you run energy, when you run current through it. It's like, okay, things are happening. I can see stuff. I'm hallucinating. <laughs> Everything has changed. You know, you can be in the situation where things are all, things are coming into you. This is a, it's some very strange experience started happening. And then I mixed that with ayahuasca as well. And ayahuasca loves dancing. Well, drugs, you probably find that I don't know that psychedelic drugs if you can actually find out how your knees work really like <laughs> moving <laughs> you've got to remember that you can still have physical control but if you do then they, they move for you and you dance with them and it's beautiful so all this was happening then I met Peter <laughs> yeah and your um, your my post college pre scarlet in print um, I travelled, I lived in Spain, I lived in Japan, um, I was practising magic um, and trying to make things work as a writer um, 
because writing's always writing's always been my passion. So I was trying to I was trying to pursue my writing um, because becoming a writer takes time and experience and life. Um, so I I was I was working on all of those things. Now obviously I was working on the 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 Red Goddess manuscript was starting to come together because holding down a day job and trying to write are not um, not always the easiest things to do even when your day job is writing. <laughs> so um, so that was that that was what I where I was at. So I was living in a variety of places. Now I spend a lot of time living in Brighton um, and working with some people in Brighton magically. Um, and working a lot of solo stuff as well. You did a lot of ordeal work. And a lot of ordeal work, um, which I, which I, <laughs> yeah, which I, I think there's another. This is another. This is another thing that I, I, I find is 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 problematic. I'm I'm still very um, I'm still very attached to this. Um, no will dare keep silent, um, and the critical. The critical issue as a writer is, uh, and, a, and a magical practitioner is, what is it appropriate to talk about, and what is it appropriate not to talk about, um, and that's something that that's a that's a that's a boundary that I see dissolving in a in a in a feedback loop driven modern world where people are people appear to be creating their altars and doing their rituals simply so that they can take selfies of themselves um, during the process. And that inevitably creates a system where people are doing magic simply because they want to tell people about what they're doing, or they want to have that that third observer position of themselves while they're doing magic, which which I, I don't think is particularly helpful. Some some things I think magically are helpful. So circulating images of deity, I think um, I don't have a problem with that. Personally, I wouldn't um, personally I wouldn't allow photos of my working tools or my. Um, precise ritual material to to, um, to to really see print in any way. Um, so talking about experiences, talking about experiences is is mixed. Um, there's, there, there are kind of lines, and it also depends on on the spirits really. Um, but let's say that for the let's say for the, the this period this this kind of seven year period working on the Red Goddess, it was a, there was a parallel there was a parallel ritual structure going along with that. Which was being, um, which was being kind of portioned out to me as I, as I went through it until kind of the, you know the the final the final result of that was me was Alkistis and, <laughs> and, and, and Scarlet and Scarlet and Paint. Yeah. I really thought that was his nemesis. <laughs> I'm gonna destroy this Peter Gray. <laughs> Who does he think he is? <laughs> what is this goddess of yours? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So naive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's still time. Yeah, yeah well, you know, yeah. I'm working yeah. on it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's interesting. If the if the Red Goddess journey was around seven years, mm. book wise, yeah. Did at the beginning, did you think um, I'm just going to write a book, or did you think actually this is the beginning of a a platform to uh, come at a wider range of ideas in in this particular way of seeing it was it always like I'm I may as well start a highly successful and celebrated uh, <laughs> <laughs> occult publisher or was it book first and then see what happened well I think like I think like a lot of um, like a lot of magicians at the time I'd spend you know I I I talk with my 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 friends um, who were all obviously magicians who were very interested in books we talk about books and ideas and what was present and what wasn't present and what kind of works we would like to see um, because the, the world of publishing and the world of material has, has, has changed beyond recognition um, in the last, e even in the last seven years since, since we began. Um, and although, although we've been influential, this has also been the result of the growth of the internet and the availability of digital publishing. Yeah. Um, so, I, you know, I'm not. I'm not saying that we are responsible for the for the shift in magical publishing. I think that's. I think it's just the ability it's, now it's, that it's technology driven. 
yeah, no, sure. that, that's yeah. technology driven that's how we could do it yeah that's how we that's, would, that's, that's what enabled us mm. to start but, but the, the idea was the idea was to publish just to publish the record list mm. because we we looked at the other publishers that were out there and so it had to be done in a certain way it was a very personal work it yeah. wasn't really something you could let go of at any stage of it so it wasn't it wasn't even that there was no one I mean there were, there were good publishers but it wasn't it was more that this was a completely ritual work from the very beginning its mm. inception and it had to be seen through to the very end and as magicians you want control over the entire process so we weren't we weren't inspired by you know an, anyone else's vision of publishing um, it the, was just for this book yeah actually. it was for this book and it's, it, it simply came out of the magical process that, that as a magician I approach everything magically so if I'm if I'm writing a book it's a magical process if I'm publishing a book it's a magical process and no one else was going to be in a position to do that for me and also because it you know it clearly isn't a commercial proposition no. yeah um, it's not just magicians who are control freaks, as Alpha just pointed out. It's yeah. an art thing as well. Yeah, yeah. it's a, yeah, it's a yeah, project. Yeah. Artists are control freaks yeah. too. Yeah, yeah. absolutely, um, absolutely. It's interesting. So I guess it's almost as if Scarlet Imprint began with the second book mm. as yeah. a publisher. Absolutely, yeah. officially, yeah. officially did. Yeah, yeah. officially, yeah. officially did. Is, um, Howlings, I guess. Yeah, Howlings is officially the birthday, but um, but the Red Goddess was the first, the first book. But um, we'd finished. We we. We finished the Red Goddess, and we, one of the one of the issues at the time was that there was a complete absence of practitioner material um, available. There just it just suddenly wasn't out there. It didn't seem to be. And I knew a lot of practitioners, and what we were very keen on doing um, was putting forward the work of many voices rather than the idea that there was one way to practice magic by by publishing um, it was almost meant to be like a snapshot of what yeah. is happening like right now yeah. in the magical world yeah. these are the people we know and some other people that we, we know of working with the grimoires that we approached and who were willing to write but completely unknown people <laughs> and it was really just like a sort of unselfconscious snapshot of yeah. this is some practice of people working with grimoires right now yeah. in this time. I mean, it's already out of date in so many ways. It's kind of interesting. It's like a glimpse of yeah. a time. And I think all of the all of the collections function in that way. I mean, we we have you know we have standards that we wish to that we wish to to have in terms of the material that we've published in the collections, but there's also a lack of judgment in the sense that. We are it giving has to have a certain amount of honesty about the actual people who about are about what's happening on the ground and about mm. the people who are happening on the ground, rather than presenting something artificial. Mm. Um, but our focus is now our focus is now far more on single author works, simply because the change of the internet means that there is a there is a, a lot of practitioner material out there. And I think things like blogs and so on are already answering that need for yeah. people having dialogue about what their practice is and that wasn't really happening. That simply at wasn't that happening time. at that period. Um, and the other thing really to, dial, to just discussion. to dial dial back on that is that um, the the impetus behind 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 howlings other than our own our own sort of personal discussions about what was missing in magic um, was was our flat filling up with the spirits of the Goetia. I don't know what happened. Who <laughs> turned up en masse. Um, one day. One day. <laughs> we hadn't even opened the wine yet. It was yeah. just like... Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> when, when, you, when, when you've got these... Yeah. When, you, when you have a house full of spirits, um, then, then generally you realise that something, that something is, is up. So... It wasn't what we were expecting. I mean, um, well, yeah. I had no in, no uh, background in that, and you were uh, you had things like the Garisha on your bookshelf, but you had looked at it and gone, "What is this Christianized?" Yeah, certainly at that at that at that point at we that were point we were we 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 were we were very early in what we were looking at in terms of the grimoire material. Um, it wasn't something that we were that we were seeking out. We were of the opinion of of the time, which was the largely. Largely, this it's is just junk. Out of date. Yeah. It's out of date. It's Christianized. It's it's dysfunctional. Um, mm. But 
but our views on that changed very rapidly. Um, we spent a long time, we spent a very long time um, working with the grimoires. So for example, when, um, when Jake Stratton came first, first approached us and said, um, I'm working on a manuscript on the Goetia, our instant reaction was, our, 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 yeah, our instant reaction was, 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 you know, we were concerned that he was working on, we like, on the same text too. that we were. <laughs> yeah. Um, what is it? <laughs> <laughs> this is a disaster. But then it turned out like it was completely different. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah, it was now our work is um, our work other you know, other than the work that's um, that's related to Babylon is um, is is Western tradition is spirit based work, but with the spirits of the That's what Babylon yeah, work is too. Yeah, it is Babylon. It's very hard to explain how they interact or fit yeah. together. But it does. Yeah, but essentially now we're working with the spirits of the Western tradition, but but very much the spirit, the spirit catalogues, the spirit lists, rather than the operating systems that have been um, attached to them. Like those mermaid things that you get in curiosity museums. You know, they put a bit of different animals. Oh, together. Fiji mermaids. The Fiji mermaids. Ah, okay. It's a bit like that. So. Where did that come from? <laughs> it's uh, I'm just thinking back to what you said that um, there are a lot of practitioners around, but there did appear to be a gap in material, sort of mid noughties Before that, there was yeah. a gap. Yeah, never occurred to me before, but there was. Yeah, um, there's a massive gap. I mean, there was the explosion with with um, with chaos magic and with mm. Toki yeah. and with um, there was this countercultural movement that was necessary to overturn the rather the rather stuffy parlor. Do you atmosphere. think it died down because of rave culture being squished and everything like that? I think, I think that there was a, it was yeah. a social thing probably yeah. that also had an impact on magic and that yeah. everybody kind of went quiet and the energy went out. Well, maybe I, that was it. This is like the uh, tide drew yeah. back. Well, I think there's an energetic uh, yeah. interpretation there. I certainly think mm. uh, in that respect. I mean, in one of Grant Morrison in his Super Gods book, he talks about that eleven-year solar cycle, and if you think mm. about say, popular culture at the time that there was a magic gap, it's sex in the city, it's very um, mm. materialistic and acquisitional, yeah. and um, uh, that was when Dawkins, w that was his second peak in fame yeah. after the 80s, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. so there's this, yeah, the, the kind of energy or um, whatever was... Uh, materialistic, Yeah, and, and it, that's quite, and, and you, you end up balancing that out and I think we're moving fortunately we're sort of I think we're mid-wave in a, in a psychedelic yeah a real uh, enchanted yeah, yeah. psychedelic, yeah, it's a psychedelic resurgence definitely yeah yeah, yeah. but it, it hadn't occurred to me that there was a book that, that, that did that but there was because I mean I was in, I was still in when, where was I then I was in New Zealand mm -hmm. um, which is closer to getting I, I found half my Kenneth Grant books in um, secondhand bookstores from mm. someone who had obviously mm. died and <laughs> <laughs> mysteriously uh, but, uh, yeah, I, I'm thinking about what, yeah. what sort of mid noughties books yeah. they were certainly um, sort of toned down practice but it was there it's an interesting observation mm. well thank you for <laughs> being part of that um, return that's interesting um because we faced, um, I mean, we faced resistance from people from um, from that old guard, from the the sort of the chaos period, who were very much punk, you know, DIY, you know, just we zero something and we punt it out. It took some of those um, some of those old slower thinkers some time to understand the fact that that the fact that we were presenting the book as a magical object didn't mean that we were we were. Um, engaged in some elitist program. I mean, they just didn't get it. They they weren't they weren't I they didn't understand the val they didn't understand the value of the book as as an object in itself. We always saw it that we were artists seizing the means of production. So just as artists and magicians being in complete control of the process, rather than as this is an elitist enterprise. Look at my lovely leather library or something like that. It was really just about having. The means to realise our vision by being in control of every aspect of it, which is why we don't put out much material. We only it's only us doing it, so right down to, I mean everything except the production of it by the printers and the binding, mm. which we decide and design and work on. Everything is done by us. It's not that we let any part of the process out. 
and uh, it, I, interesting observation to do with um, them not getting the significance of the book uh, a sort of old guard lack of understanding because that was me in the 90s um, I was very much a dial-up digital utopian uh, yeah. and I really did think mm. this glorious um, multi-identity, multi-gender future was, was coming down the pipes yeah. and instead we have cat photos so it's actually been <laughs> yeah. a, uh, it's been a restriction of available yeah. identities but yeah. so I'm, I'm a recovering digital utopian mm. uh, and by the same time I have a, yeah, a, a career in media strategy and um, the book was a victim of its own laziness yeah. uh, and yeah, that's definitely. actually what mm. largely killed it mm. they worked out somewhere in the mid 20th century how bad a book could needs to be in terms of quality before people will stop buying it yeah. and then and they so went half a step really above it shocking. and that was what a book was yeah. so if you look at mass market paperbacks um, they, they worked out and you see them now you buy them in second hand books you can see through the pages mm. and this was it because it was box shifting yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's so, so I, I view yeah I don't it's think so it's an so elitist cynical. program mm. as much as it is um, a reorganization of, of what is valuable and, and how these mm. things can be communicated so that's yeah. not at all um, I mean I was very influenced by characters like Alfie Jerry because he had this um, he worked on some Journals like Limoche and um, Perhinderion, which were like super over the top. He, he kind of blew his entire inheritance creating these beautiful, beautiful books with amazing pictures in and on beautiful paper. And this, you know, as an artist, he wanted to do this. It is about beauty and putting beauty in the world because that also seemed to be something that was conspicuously missing. And so, I mean, there was a reason why Howlings was turquoise with gold and shimmering it was meant to look beautiful and not black and to have these qualities which are not associated with dark and spooky and all these kind of Precious. I mean the world is so rich and the spirit world is so rich there are so many ways to express it and for it to express itself that I just couldn't understand this aesthetic that most magical so called magical people were going in for and still do to some extent which is just like spooky sigils and and black. <laughs> so rather teenage boy. It's, yeah, uh, it is just like uh, um, hammer horror props, and not the I good ones. Not yeah. good ones. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's just so much possibility what you can do with color and texture and all these things, pattern. It's just <laughs> there's so much to explore. Okay, so we've got that's really good. Um, we've gone all the way to from childhood scarlet imprint. We're done. <laughs> we're done. One, one more topic, which we've sort of um, half got onto, which is, I guess, the, um, the state of the magical world today. How is it different from more, I guess, for Pete, because you've had a longer yeah. experience of yeah. the Western esoteric sure. tradition. Um, how does this, uh, how does the world look in 2014? Um, the good bits and the bad bits. Do a forecast. <laughs> CNBC forecast. Um, well, I think there are some very critical things that... that haven't been understood by the magical community, which, which means that it's it's lagging badly. Um, critically, the fact that we're living in, in the uh, Anthropocene, the fact that we are um, when I talk about when I talk about in the Red Goddess, when I talk about apocalypse, people start to people pe people were 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 very reticent to even hear the word. Um, and now there are more people using it, but largely in a horror movie sense, without a, uh, an understanding of perhaps some of the hard earth science issues, which are mm. which are starting to bite. And without um, an understanding of the historical and without meaning of apocalypse, yeah, um, and apocalyptic writing. But we're now in a position where um, where man-made man-made uh, climate change has become has become climate collapse, and um, the more the more bleak scenarios proposed, for example, um, Guy McPherson's work uh, are predicting, um, are looking at near-term human extinction um, on a time scale of between between 50 and 200 years, depending on the degree of pessimism with which you, you assess the data. Um, magic needs to get its head around this very quickly because we're living in the midst of an extinction crisis and the, the work that we do which is based on, on spirit and land. Um, the spirits that we're dealing with 
are, are embedded in place. They're embedded in plants. They're embedded in animals. They're expressed in these ways, and we're losing them. We're losing, uh, we're losing our materia magica uh, hand over fist at the rate of 200 species a day. And to, to have a magic which lives in, a, in a, an artificial past where we're pretending that we're doing toad magic when we lost, we're losing our amphibians at a staggering rate when we're talking about the horseman's word, but Nobody no one knows one horses. end of the horse from another. This seems to be to be an entirely reductive way of approaching things. I think magic really needs to orientate and ground itself in, in the world as, as it, it is. is. And the world as it is unfolding, and the world as it is unfolding, is an unstable, chaotic, dangerous and apocalyptic place. When we say that we're working with Babylon, then people immediately assume that, well, it's it's still obviously just the drugs sex. and the sex mm -hmm. and the the drugs and the sex are, some are, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but the drugs and the sex are part of an eschatology yeah. and now yeah. now everyone whether they like whether they like it or not if she's they a wish goddess to make of love and war yeah. she's a goddess of death yeah i mean there's a babylon is an eschatological goddess if she's appearing in culture in any way it should be a warning sign to people yeah. not just a, a sign that women should be emancipating themselves she's it's not a thelemic goddess it's a <laughs> much bigger thing than that yeah. she goes back to the earliest goddesses the origins are very deep but but to drag it back on on track slightly i mean we're yeah, sorry <laughs> <laughs> we now we're now all essentially in a position where we have to be where we have to be taking a fierce path approach mm -hmm. where we have to be understanding that the situation that we find ourselves in is is battlefield conditions um, and l a lot of people are going to die within our lifetimes uh, living standards are going to crash through the floor um, the weather is going to begin to kill people in in, in significant numbers. numbers large parts of America will become uninhabitable within the very very soon future um, magically Magically, it's good in terms of the amount of publishing, in terms of the amount of networking. Um, yeah. Well, why, why do you think, um, is it a lack of understanding or is it just sheer cognitive dissonance? Or <laughs> is it um, operating, despite what people think they're doing, operating in this um, sort of Edwardian, nudist, Tory mm -hmm. fantasy version of the bucolic countryside? I, mm -hmm. I, yeah. Which piece do you think is because I, I agree wholeheartedly I mean I um, yeah uh, what what is the thing that is preventing more people talking about it rather than yeah well, doing an Instagram things, photo of, of, yeah. of a candle with a toad on it I think it's um, one of the things I talked about in, in, in my essay in 16 about normalcy bias I think normalcy bias is a critical mm -hmm. element in, in the human condition people simply do not expect things to change they always reset to the idea that everything will be okay because because everything was okay yesterday yeah, so it's a way of coping with the stress situation I think the the electronic feedback loop of the always on connection um, distorts people's um, distorts people by setting up this this reward feedback loop which means that people spend their lives feeding an online identity without actually living their lives. So I this is this is a great thing that... a lot about the magical <laughs> community is that it is very much embedded in the greater cultural sphere. So it still reflects the values of the culture, which yeah. are still very, very materialistic and very much to We're do with this world of illusion. And magic should be seen through that, but it still seems to be actually nestled quite comfortably in it and people are playing with their identities so, yeah. in these ways and they're not actually going against that current at all. And there that, should be more salmon out and that, there. That, there's yeah. some fewer yeah. salmon and more yes. goldfish. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean this is what you saw with mm. um, the, the, the the culture movement, mm. the you know, of, of uh, Genesis Peorage's stuff, the journals such as Rapid Eye, um, the work of Carl Abramson, this this a cultural approach has has somewhat dropped out mm. and people people are people in magic are too mainstream now yeah it feels like they're like not radical enough no. the move to create a culture that 
you know, supports this sort of work seems to have really dropped off. Everyone still seems to be embedded very much in the mainstream culture. And and I see, going back to what you were saying, um, that that strange um, third person position of people arranging altars and taking photos of them to put on Instagram mm. is mm. exactly what you're saying about it's uh, that's not a magical problem. No. That's because that is the sort of selfie behavior. Yeah, it's across, just the uh, same people, the people are behaving the same way. Yeah, yeah it's continuum. Yeah. There doesn't mm. seem to be that disconnect, and really the magician has to have more isolation from that world. And as you say, that rebellion. It, it's rebellion, the, of course. Yeah, yeah, it needs to be almost by definition. It is. But you have satanic. to go against the current. Yes. You have to. Yeah, and if that's perceived as Satanism, that's one interpretation of it. But it's. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm unashamedly Luciferian about. Yeah. Um, well, be careful what you say. <laughs> <laughs> in, in that respect, I, yeah. I'm surprised. Yeah. At, I'm surprised at the pieces, and this has come up quite recently. Um, I'm surprised at the pieces of uh, the monocultural control mechanism mm. that have been not just absorbed but yeah. lionized. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. And that I, I think is odd. <laughs> it's not very critical. Mm. <laughs> it's not long-term thinking. So how how do I mean? Is do we get to that very? Uh, which, to be fair, I'm, I'm on board with. Do we get to that sort of very nihilistic stage where we go well? They'll find out one way or the other. <laughs> or do we say, actually, um, this needs to be addressed? Because I, I, I have two things. I have the nihilism or the inevitableism of um, the disruptions are going to happen to everyone. Mm. Yeah. So you either prepare for it or you don't. Um, or, But the other side of it is I do have this weird half-belief that uh, as occultists, we um, the impact of our consciousness is actually greater than say if you how many practicing occultists do you think there are Western occultists do you think there are in the world twenty thousand nowhere near that number yeah. no. nowhere near that number so if we got twenty thousand normals or yeah. let's yeah. just guess that let's say it's ten thousand but if we got twenty thousand normals and match them I think the the collective consciousness impact at least if we're doing mm. it right is going to be stronger on the occultist side than the normals yeah. sure. so I have these two things running in my head which is it's going to happen anyway um, mm. and not in a not in a you know genocidal sense but in the sense that they will learn when the first disruption disrupts their normalcy bias uh, it's when it and then there's the other side which is well, actually individual can, level. Yeah. Yeah. but can't we can't we do what do we do about it? Can't we do something about it other than can we beat? Is it just beating the drum? I think it's. Uh, what do you think we should do about it? It's a good question. Mm. I mean, at the moment, I'm veering towards developing work so that uh, disincarnating doesn't mean we're not continuing what we're doing. Mm. That's. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. I'm just. I'm sort of a bit like a. Pyra, I'm looking after myself. <laughs> no, you should. It's about, but I also, I think, um, yeah, you need, uh, if I could do anything, uh, and I mean, sure, mm. certain intelligence agencies have tried, but if you could um, intoxicate, and I mean properly intoxicate, mm. large populations. You're putting LSD in the water again, yeah. aren't you, Gordon? I'm going to give it a shot, can't afford it. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what this new job's about? Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I think, um, I mean, I think Graham Hancock mentioned years mm. ago that if anyone who wants to hold public office should have to do 10 days of ayahuasca mm. Mm. Uh, he's very very I quite like that I think yeah if, <laughs> if we ayahuasca. end up ruling the sort of you know post Cormac McCarthy the road world mm. then we'll, we'll make that law number one <laughs> but then you yeah. look at There's then you look at Leary's ex- then you look at Leary's experience, experiments um, um, back in the early days of LSD research when he was taking people to the um to the campus church on on LSD and seeing whether the the use of psychedelics would induce a religious experience in people. And what the study showed was that people who were previously um, previously set up for it, they had their religious upbringing, they, you know, they, they were inclined, had those religious experiences and the others didn't. Mm. But, but on the yeah. other side, there's, um, there's Strassman's DMT molecule where, where Strassman reaches the stage with, um, with injecting um, 
a control group with DMT the where they all dose. where they yeah. all, where they all yeah. joke that there is the god dose beyond which no one is an atheist. They're yeah. all joking anymore. Yeah, but, but funnily enough, yeah. funnily enough, they won't be able to repeat. I those think experiments. we need to talk <laughs> about death. I think we need to talk about death quite a lot. I think if you look at the modern traditions, none of them really have a developed eschatology at all. It's no. as if even because they don't they're have, all in denial about it because Nobody they don't have the experience knows how to of take death people through these experiences it's it's something that's missing it's, in a, it's another extension of this um, the greater world culture um, being exactly absorbing the same that uh, the magical world does it's they're all in denial about death and you see that even amongst magicians and witchcraft I mean they will talk about it and they will be <laughs> but it's, it's, they don't have an eschatology. They don't know how to deal with it. They don't have a way to navigate through those spaces. And it's missing from yeah. all the modern traditions that I can completely. see. Completely. Completely. There is no. And they'll talk about self development. But in there's life, no, they have no biotechnology because they don't have the experience of it. And the reason that they don't have the experience of it is that they're not, they're not engaged in the, in the ordeal practices which enable them to go through death in life which is what you should mark to. someone out as a functioning magical practitioner. And unless people are prepared to go to those places, and it's only a few people who are ever going to be inclined or wish to go to those places, that they can count themselves as magicians. We don't have many of them. And we don't have many people in witchcraft either for exactly the same reasons. I and mean, when you look back when you look back at witchcraft books that were written um, you know, 10, 20 years ago, everyone in witchcraft believed in reincarnation. Mm. Everyone. Yep. everyone and the reason they all believed in reincarnation is I think they were all taking LSD and because they were taking LSD they were having past life experiences and because they were having past life experiences they realised they were part of a, a great chain of being whereas what I see um, I, I know it's a generalisation what I see in many many modern magicians and many modern witches is that they because they haven't had that experience they haven't died they have not been initiated they haven't been to the other world and come back in life all they have is some, some basic low-level practices and some feel-good stuff and a couple of end candlesticks, which, quite frankly, isn't going to do them any fucking good when the shit comes down. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Damn right. So, the death and life experience is maybe the thing that can... This is interesting because yeah. I'm, I'm on board with that. If you, there's no getting the toothpaste back into the tube, um, yeah. you yeah. you need to. And you need to face what's happening. And if no. and if it doesn't, um, if it doesn't happen, if that particular um, other world experience didn't work, do it again, do it stronger, do another one. Yeah. I, I think it's a finish to start deliverable to mm. use a project management term. I think some of the to... issues as well are that the culture is very much health and safety. Mm. And if you're following a magical shamanic path, you really have to like. There is, there is no, safety. there is yeah. no, there's no safe, safe word. word. No, you know, there, there is, is no, no safe, safe word. word. Yeah. I mean, I know because I've come from a background where mental instability was a huge issue. So I have a lot of experience of being in unbalanced states, and I know that it's very dangerous. I'm very careful with the work I do because I can see that it's not easy and it's not right for everybody. But. <sighs> Equally, if people are messing with that and are playing with these things, or even if they're doing it with serious intent, if it goes wrong, it goes wrong. I don't really... <laughs> it happens. There has to be casualty rate because that's what happens. There has to be risk, you know. There has to be a risk. It's, it's risk. natural selection. It's how you get to these places. There has to be risk. You have to step over. You have to be unreasonable. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Well, what an excellent uh, final sentence. You have to be unreasonable. Aim to misbehave. <laughs>